All right, good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everybody that's showed up. Uh, welcome to the Build Your Nastran NCAD IQ webinar series. Today we're going to be talking about predicting and validating welds with FEA. Our main speaker today will be Vince Adams. Uh, my name is Dean Rose. I'm part of the Autodesk support team here, and uh, I will pass the microphone to Vince Adams and let him continue the conversation. Uh, feel free to type any questions that you have uh, in the question box for the GoToWebinar, and we'll try to get to you as we go through. And uh, have a Let's go ahead and take it away, Vince. All right. Thank you, Dean. I would thank everybody for tuning in this morning. Uh, hopefully, you'll find this information helpful if you're doing, if you're modeling weldments and you're concerned with the strength of the welds, and interested in using. Uh, NASTRA and NCAT or FEA in general because some of the most of the conversation is is uh, software neutral uh, I think you'll learn a lot a little bit about my background and I don't have a background slide to show you is I've been doing this for about 25 years and as a consultant focused a lot on, on two completely opposite areas plastic product analysis and weld studies for customers so so I uh, spent a lot of time uh, digging up the best practices and and actually kind of debunking what a lot of engineers tried to do with FBA um, on welds so so hopefully you'll learn a lot please feel free to ask questions uh, I think it should be pretty straightforward when I lay it out for you Make sure this working. So a little bit about the webinar series. If you've been on these others, you know it's something that we do monthly. We have many, many, many topics that are coming up, and all the recordings are available for you on Dean. They're on for the recordings. Sim Hub. The recordings are on YouTube. So um, after this webinar, you'll get an update email with the link for that. So uh, we also have some information available on a box account. Uh, pertaining to this presentation so awesome thanks for jumping in and bailing me out so lots and lots of information uh, you could essentially build a uh, FE training course specifically with these webinars so I think you should be checking those out if you don't um, some new things to if you're an NCAD user the SAP the subscription advantage pack for 2016 is almost like a new release there's so much functionality that came out with that. We're very excited to be able to, to share it with our customers and, and look forward to the uh, next release coming out in May. If you haven't downloaded, I highly recommend that you do. And, um, and, and there should be a link on the material you can download that will get you to that place. Um, also, in the uh, older news, uh, I'd like to point out the, the self-paced training. We have a a uh, specific training class for NCAD that we built into the software so that you can uh, walk through in your own pace. These are not tutorials, these are actual exercises that an instructor might use. So uh, you've got the best that we're putting out uh, available to you to learn NCAD. So let's get into the presentation. As Dean said, don't hesitate to throw questions out. Uh, if, if I see a question and it's germane to what I'm actually speaking about, uh, I'll try and get to it right away. If it's something that is not uh, related to the slide I'm on or the topic I'm on, uh, I'll take care of it at the end. What I what I suggest is if you ask a question and it didn't get answered right away, stay till the end, and that's when I'll go through the list of questions. Uh, if it's a uh, basically a generic NCAT or generic FBA question, Dean may respond to you. Um, independently of the presentation. So so certainly throw out your questions, but uh, remember that all of them will get answered at the end if they don't get answered in line. So we're going to cover some weld terminology. Again, this is a class on, on, this is a session on how do you predict welds using FEA. And I know it might sound easy. You just build the weld bead and inventor and you mesh it and you've got an analysis. But the, the fact of the matter is that rarely works. While, while it'll give you answers, those answers are rarely meaningful. And we're going to cover that, and hopefully, hopefully you'll understand why most people, uh, most people seem to, to, to almost have an aha moment when we go through the first few slides, and then we try to build you back up to what you can do. So we'll talk about those challenges. We're focusing on static weld sizing, not weld fatigue. Um, so uh, single overload, and we'll talk about why that's different than fatigue. Um, and, and we'll talk about it a little bit, but 
fatigue is a whole completely different topic that if there's interest uh, we can we can have a, a separate session uh, next year and then definitely ask questions if they come up so before we get started and this is probably the most important slide in the whole presentation except in very very unique circumstances you should never expect accurate stress on your FE model near or in a weld and and this is the this is the one that hopefully sets the tone for the rest of the presentation. Uh, if you're modeling your weld beads and you're meshing and you're looking at the stresses in or near your weld bead and say, I think we're okay. Uh, while I've, I've been around long enough to know you can never say it's always wrong, you're probably not drawing the correct conclusion from that information and we'll talk about why. I would also want you to understand trying to put more accurate geometry in your CAD model to capture the weld bead is not going to give you more accurate stresses in your welds. And we'll talk about why on that. And then the last point is my recommendation in this, and you're going to see why, and hopefully the point will be clear and the case will be made, but my recommendation is that you use the results from FEA to guide you to weld sizing outside of FEA. And you'll see the techniques I'm going to recommend for that. Um, and the last point I want to make is most of this class is going to focus on weldments of sheet metal or or geometry that's best uh, modeled in FEA with plates or shells. Uh, we'll talk about solids, um, but shell modeling is is the most common big weldments most commonly modeled with thin wall members. If you don't use shell elements, but you do a lot of thin walled sheet metal. You know, we should probably touch base or touch base with our support group on how to start incorporating shells in your model. With the Service Advantage Pack um, uh, of 2016, uh, mid-plane extraction has now been added, so it's much easier to get to uh, shell modeling in NCAD. So a couple of three key points. Don't expect your stresses to be right in a weld. Don't expect you can make them better by adding better weld bead geometry, and consider trying to use the data from the analysis to calculate a well using more traditional methods, more reliable that way. So what do we mean by that? First, we need to be on the same page on terminology. And really, the couple, there's a lot of terminology. Heat affected zone is very important. It'll come up a little bit, but it's not germane to this conversation. Huge to well design and well fatigue. And that's not as critical to the calculations of static weld sizing but very important concept to be understood. Uh, weld leg and weld throat are different. When you talk about weld size, typically you're thinking of the weld length, of the leg length. When we talk about weld size and computations, we're talking about the throat depth. And, and in calculations, we're actually talking about the theoretical throat depth, not the actual throat, which is going to vary depending on, on how the weld comes out, convex, concave, more flat, ground down, right? Um, the reason we concern ourselves with the throat is that all static weld sizing calculations are based on the expectation failure is through the throat or the strength of a weld is based on the throat size. And this is different than weld fatigue, which again, we're not going to get into today, but any weld fatigue calculations are assuming the weld fails at the toe of the weld. Um, we old fatigue hands say that, that the toe of a weld is a crack waiting to happen. And we just assume that's where the crack is going to start. We're not going to talk about that, but remember that when we talk about weld size, pretty much going on through the presentation, we're talking about the throat depth. So a little bit more on the geometry of a seam weld. Uh, on a filler weld, we might model it like many of those examples over to the left. The reality is much different. And this is actually a chair I have in my house where there are six or seven of those slats on the back. None of those welds look the same. So when you first start talking about, I'm going to model my weld inside a CAD, which one of these welds did you model? And I'm looking at stress on an FE of a model of the weld. Which bubbly weld um, stress are you expecting to be correct? The fact of the matter is, uh, rarely, and, and usually not without uh, uh, secondary operations, Will a weld ever look like your CAD model? Um, and, and, and that's the first, I guess, the first step down the, down the understanding that, well, then, if I can't model the geometry right, how can I expect my stress to be right? You can't. And that's, that's one of the key uh, foundations of this, this concept we're discussing today. So what else is different? Well, we talked about the geometry. But there's also penetration, full or partial penetration. What about grinding? What about continuity with a weld start and stop? 
Um, I, I've done a lot of weld studies for large industrial uh, uh, vehicles, commercial vehicles, uh, mining, farming, where weld start stop that wasn't in the print, not anticipated in the simulation, were the locations of the failure. Hard to predict if you don't know that's going to happen, right? Um, the chemistry, uh, temperature, preheat, and cooling causes huge residual stresses in the problem, causes a heat affected zone that is embrittled by, um, uh, by uh, the, the, the chemical reaction and the heating. Um, there's just so much and warpage that happens. If you just take a look at this list and ask yourself, if I didn't account for all of this in the FEA, how do I know my stress in my weld is right? First of all, you can't account for most of this. I'd say almost all of it is not easily accounted for in any commercial FEA package. Um, geometry is your best bet. And, and again, getting the geometry of these welds is very difficult. So, so, so setting the stage, a weld is an extremely nasty, complex uh, design element. And uh, to model it with a fillet or a chamfer, mesh it and think that stress is real, is probably um, not a fair statement. So the question is, if I get better on my CAD model and I, I try to make my CAD model look like the geometry I think it's going to look like, will I get better results? Hopefully you know by now the answer just from those first couple slides is going to be no. So what can you do? What we recommend is, is that you try to understand what the weld model is telling you. A couple other reasons why the FE model, you know, just FE part of it in general is not recommended is FE models for welds typically have starts and they have stops uh, and they end up with singular, which is sharp corners where the stress diverges, right? Singular stresses or really high stresses. Those hotspots are not real because the geometry isn't real. Uh, and I've seen many an engineer struggle with trying to remove those hotspots when in reality you remove the hotspots but you couldn't make the results more accurate because of all those other reasons so that was a lot of wasted time we talked about the geometry not bearing any resemblance to reality um, and then the other is the other is to calculate stresses in a weld you have to estimate your weld size in in a pure design environment we would prefer you let the simulation tell you how big the weld ought to be you have to guess a weld size and then you want to try and figure out if it's going to be good enough why not let the analysis say, how much weld do you need? I prefer an approach that says, let's assume I can get a weld on there that is going to work. Let's design my structure and then find out what, based on my final design, how much weld do I need to handle the loads going through that particular area. So really, that's where we're going to be focusing our discussion. And just to hammer home the difficulty of getting realistic stresses, even if the geometry and the heat affected zone and the shrinkage and all that was predictable. Uh, we'll look at a couple different examples. The side one, the same part, different welds on each side. We modeled the side one, we're trying to put a concave weld face and fillets to smooth things out so it may not be so so singular, so so abrupt. Whereas the other side is is modeled with a, you know, just a straight chamfer across um, starts and stops, uh, start stop, uh, hard stop, partial penetration, which means that it's only um, bonded at the weld um, legs, not the bottom of the plate. What we see is the stresses on both of these problems diverge. If you're not comfortable running convergent studies, it's the, the process of refining your mesh, and refining your mesh, and refining your mesh, smaller and smaller and smaller in areas of high stress, to you see the stress levels out. That's your converged stress. Singular sharp points, point loads, sharp corners are divergent in that the stress will never uh, converge because the uh, the stresses will continue to go to affinity because of the sharp corners. It's an F. It's a it's a um, uh, F divided by A where A equals zero situation. So so now we've got a stress. What does that stress mean? Well, it means nothing because you never know what it really is. It can never be real because it's divergent. And another thing to think about inside of a partial penetration well is that right where the weld stops, we have um, a zero radius crack. That's the physical condition you've provided to the solver and asking it to give you a reasonable result. Um, that's It's a very complex calculation in crack tip and crack tip propagation and you're never going to capture that with just 
raw FE modeling meant for continuous geometry. So there are so many things happening in your FE model, even if you could get the geometry of the weld correct. So is there a geometry that you can converge? Well, in this particular case, an extreme, which may happen for some of you, uh, assuming full penetration, a concave weld, so it eliminates that singularity at the bottom of a chamfer, right, wrapped around the entire plate, this does converge. Why does this converge? Because it's not really modeled like a weld anymore. If you get to this particular design or this configuration, it's essentially like a casting that's got a fillet around a protrusion. So it converges because it's, it's not modeled like a typical weld. Does that make it more correct? So the question I would ask is, 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 is this real? If you're doing this just to get it to converge, but it doesn't match reality, uh, you're, you're going down a bad place. Uh, the worst thing you ever can do in analysis is, is uh, change your model to make answers come out what you think they ought to be, because then you might as well just write the answer down and then move on without wasting your time doing the analysis. Let the analysis model the physics you know to be real, model it with as best intentions you can. If you're not sure how to handle something, that's what support's for. Uh, guys like Dean can, can certainly point you in the right direction and then let that guide you. Don't force the model to give an answer you've predetermined because that's, that's uh, almost wasting the time in FEA. But, so what can you do if, that's, if you have real welds and you want to find out what's going on with those welds? So let's talk about methods for modeling seam welds. Uh, we talked about how uh, the geometry doesn't match, but that said, and, and I'm quite sure, and you know who you are, some of you are still going to keep modeling the, the welds in your CAD model. Um, if they want to do that, what can you get out of that? Well, is there a chance when the CAD and FE model can realistically prepare a response? I would say that only in the case of the previous example or if you have really solid bulky, bulky geometry with full or very close to full penetration so that, so that the... Uh, the, the area around the weld can be considered as if it was a casting. You've ground the surface so it becomes predictable. You've heat treated it so that the weld properties are the same as the surrounding properties. You've eliminated the heat affected zone because you've heat treated it back to a base material property and you have no local cracking uh, that could cause early failure. That's the condition where modeling your welds as solids is going to give you reasonable results. And, and again, you have to ask yourself, is this reality? In most sheet metal cases, this is not going to be the reality. Some solid, and I've had a couple in my career where we've had the conditions where we could get really good stresses on a weld. They're few and far between. I, I may say in 25 years of doing this, and, 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 and I was a full-time analysis guy, maybe twice um, has that come up. So, so keep in mind, this is not normal. Uh, and you need to deal to deal with reality and the way you model things. So how do people model welds in, in an FE model? We looked at number one, all solids. We talked about why that is, you know, the pros and cons of that technique. Um, some people want to take a shell model and throw a, a solid weld bead in. Anytime you mix solids and shells, you've introduced error. Anytime you bond dissimilar elements, you introduce error. So in addition to all the other error, and reasons why the weld response is not going to be right, you've introduced a couple more mathematical errors into your problem, so you've made it even more wrong, not more right. Um, a number of companies will uh, assume that the load or the stress in that area is not going to be correct, but they'll, if you can see by the gray in number three, a thicker shell right at the weld area that, that gives you more stiffness with the assumption that you know, the weld adds stiffness to the model. Keep in mind, uh, this technique has been used. It's not meant to give you better stresses, just to add some stiffness. Another technique is the model of the weld face in number four. There are some, some solutions for weld uh, studying that use this technique. Um, they're very specific and they use an effective notch method to try and pull out a calculated stress, not the stress directly on the shell. So it needs post-processing that is proprietary in, in some cases. Um, number five is it's really an old way of doing it. I don't think many people do this anymore, but it's using rigid elements, rigid bars, uh, multi-point constraints, or MPCs to attach across gaps. Again, with the assumption the stresses locally are going to be garbage, with the load transfer might be okay. And then there are a couple other ones. And number six is basically just modeling it as if there are no welds. You've got continuous mesh across or bonded contact across the different sheet metal parts where the welds are. 
and then then move on. And you'll see that's my recommendation. While um, uh, while all these methods are being used by people uh, in different industries, they some are easy, some are hard. I would say that trying to add specific weld elements all over your sheet metal model is extremely hard considering the alternatives, and they add meshing error to the problem, as we discussed. None of these are going to improve the local validity of your stresses. Uh, they will transfer the load at varying degrees of correctness, depending on what stiffness the weld adds to the local joint. Um, so the number the two we're going to talk about primarily today is the solids we talked about, which is, is difficult, um, but there are some ways you can get some validity out of it, but that's gets a chore um, to do it right. And then number six, which is really very easy, and you'll see in the next couple of slides how easy it is to compute a weld size without with the, e it's the easiest FE modeling technique of all these, and it gives you the weld size the fastest. Um, and when you think about why you're doing simulations to get answers, it's not to prove you can sweat it out and slug it out on a really difficult model. There are no points for that, and 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 it's. Yeah, it's 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 not something that you're going to be rewarded for unless it makes you feel good. Um, I would suggest that most of us want to get the right answer as fast as possible, and that may mean say, well, I want to model the weld be, but acknowledge that it's not the fastest and best way to do it. Let me show you an easier way, and and hopefully you'll you move to that. So let's talk about static weld sizing. As I said earlier, I prefer to assume that. I can develop. I can come up with a weld that carries the load once I know what that load is. So I design my structure without worrying about it, unless I need uh, weld geometry to affect my mass and dynamics or local stiffness. And local stiffness might be an issue with. If I turn that off. Um, local stiffness might be an issue with um, your weld bead size is so large compared to your sheet metal size. Um, I would solve the model to try and find the areas that should be considered for uh, weld control. So what we'll look at is my entire weldment, I look where the highest stresses are, the highest loads are, and say, uh, those are my areas that are going to control the weld I can use in, area in, in, in that particular area. So I'll pick and choose. Often when I do consulting projects, I often chose uh, to, you know, I'd say that we do a weldment without the welds, and then we charge a per weld study price because you pick a couple that control it and then in most cases those will tell you if I have to have a quarter inch weld over here the rest of that weld is going to be a quarter inch so I just want to find the worst cases and then we pull the loads out and you use those loads to predict how much weld we need and you'll show the exact techniques but this is pretty pretty held as a long-term best practice and the technique we're going to be talking about is is considered a handful it's called a handful of different things um, it's documented in, in Shigley, and we'll look at Shigley, it's documented in Lincoln Welding. Um, it's, a, it's, it's often called the throat shear method, but essentially you break the weld down as a line and you use that to sim uh, simplify the computations of how much load's going through the weld. And the great thing about this is, is it uses forces that are not mesh dependent. Remember, any stresses, and we looked at convergence on the solids, any stresses near a weld are going to be very sensitive to the mesh forces are. It's a free body diagram. I pull with a pound, I get a pound reaction force. Uh, the forces in a mesh are going to give you a similar confident response. With those forces, with some very well, uh, I guess, well vetted, mature techniques, I mean, if you look at the, the Lincoln Welding guy was written in 1963, um, you know, it's, 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 it's almost as old as me. Um, it gives you that walks you through the process and how to do this. So I do recommend you do some research on on, on these techniques. I'm going to show you an even easier way uh, to use the FE results. These are hand counts. We'll walk through a couple of hand counts, but these are even easier ways to get a better understanding on how you can pull the results out of out of FE. So here's our first example. It's a butt weld. And a butt weld, we assume, we assume the nominal throat size, is, the theoretical throat size, is the thickness of the plate. Right, I'm offering up a couple example or a couple uh, uh, yeah, properties from AWS for an E60 double X weld. We're going to assume a thousand, 10,000 pounds pulling on a eighth inch thick plate. So I'm going to take you into Inventor. What you're going to see is we're going to start off in Inventor, um, and, and if there's some SolidWorks and CAD users, we'll get to what you can do without Inventor. But I think this is really important. If you've got a weldment in Inventor, we have a, tick, a tool called Weld Calculator. I don't know, did the polls get loaded? 
So we get asked, does anybody use the weld calculator? No, the polls aren't loaded. It, it's not coming across in the meeting, but feel free to, to post a question or just a uh, observation if you uh, use the weld calculator. Yeah, so if anybody's used it, just put out in the comments or the notes or the questions, yeah, I've used it. It's under the weld tab when you convert your assembly to a weldment. You have to do this, feature request. Don't force you to create a weldment to get into it. There's now a button called weld calculator. If I click on this, I see I've got a solder calculator. We're not talking about that. And then a number of different weld types. So there's fill of welds. We'll look at that in a little bit. Plug welds, spot welds, and also a butt weld calculator. We're going to use that one for this particular problem. If you remember from the problem definition, um, we had a normal force of 10,000 pounds. 10,000 pounds. And then these buttons, these illustrations say, what sort of loading is my weld going to take? We're talking about a normal force on the weld, with, but you can have pure shear, in-plane bending, out-of-plane bending, or uh, torque, which is axial torsion on the, on the problem. This is the one we're going to compute, so it's very straightforward. I'm going to say use the weld load, uh, just pure normal force. I put in 10,000 pounds for my load. Uh, the default quarter inch, I'm going to change that to an eighth of an inch. Weld length, I'm going to leave blank because we want the software to come back and compute for us. What is the minimum weld length on this on this butt weld that can handle this load? So I can leave that blank because it's going to come back and calculate that for me. And then I also said in the E60XX weld, I had a uh, yield strength of 50 KSI, so 50, a tensile strength of 62. I had a safety factor of uh, 1.7, so that default comes out just right. Now, don't hit OK or Enter here. I do that all the time. You say Calculate. And what it comes back is a computation. It says the minimum weld size, which, again, in the weld calculator is the weld throat, is 0.085. Well, we're eighth of an inch, so we're good there. Um, the minimum length, so that's with a 4-inch length, because I left that at 4. Uh, minimum length of weld I need is 2.7. So within seconds, and I, if you don't talk through it, it goes even faster. Within seconds, we have a minimum weld length. Let me go back to my presentation. If you use standard hand calculations, what do you get? 2.7. So it gives you faster, although this is a pretty fast calculation, it gives you faster uh, computation of your weld sizing without having to worry about how much mesh did I converge my mesh does my geometry look like the weld geometry I'm using the loads with the assumption that I can get the weld I need to put on the drawing and it's independent of the CAD model or the FEA so this is a pretty simple one not a bad time to pause for a second if anybody has any questions on that because we're going to build off of that concept as we go Oh, we just have a couple questions from Glenn, um, or observations, I guess. He's commenting on the porosity of the weld there. Yep, um, do porosity you have... of the weld, okay. Um, we're not talking about porosity of the weld. I guess I'm not sure how that applies to... It, it goes back to that conversation of all those things that can happen in a weld that make your make your ability to, um, make your ability to predict your stress using FEA uh, difficult to impossible. Um, and then my, my, my feeling is that if you use a safety factor, good safety factor, that's really covering all those things you can't control. Sure. In the model. Was there anything, anything else? It looks like there's some other comments in there. Uh, I mean, a comment about uh, Omer, Omer Blodgett. Blodgett, yeah. So I mentioned the Lincoln Welding Guide. That was written by Blodgett. I've got two huge books sitting right here in front of me. Of Blodgett wrote, right? So it started that this, what, what the comment was, was that Blodgett was the first to suggest this methodology. So you're right, I should have mentioned his name. It's a Lincoln Welding Guide, and I forget it's Blodgett, but yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of great info. If you do a lot of weldments, they're only, they're, the, when I got them, of course it was 20 years ago, I got them from Lincoln Welding Guide. They're really cheap. Uh, tons of information in those. So, all right, let's keep moving then. So now let's look at a slightly more complex example. And this was an example inside of Shigley, 5th edition, where you've got a welded uh, lug, for lack of a better term, right? Uh, 
the example in the book walks through computations of, of what weld size is required. They actually, they pro, the weld size of a quarter inch is spec, weld length, a leg of quarter inch is spec uh, for a 1,200 pound load. And it took a few pages of calculations and I got a safety factor of, of 9.89. So what I'd like to do is let's let's now repeat that inside the weld calculator, and this will be a fillet weld calculator. So we'll go to that one and fill out the form. In this particular case, the first thing you should think of when you get into fillet welds is what's the weld form? Essentially, if you if you look on down on the weld, if you look down on the weld, what's the shape of the weld bead? In this case, it's a box. In this example, it wraps around the lug such that you can assume it's a box. There are other shapes. Picking the right shape is really important. If you pick the wrong shape, you're not going to get the right answer. So, so in this case, we've got a box. Um, we've got a, if you remember the picture, I've got a load up at an angle. So I'm going to choose that loading orientation for the fill of weld. And then we're going to fill out the form. And that it's not 2,000. It's, it was 1,200 pounds. The angle was... 60. Uh, the Z coordinate was 1. The Y coordinate was 2 and a quarter. Weld height was a quarter. You saw that. Uh, beam height in this case was 2 and a half. And this is all the dimensions are pretty well. So it's really well laid out little app. It's been here for seven or eight years. If you haven't used it, it's it's been around for a while. And it's a quarter of an inch. Now again, don't hit enter. Um, because that will make it go away. Let's put in our, our yield strength was 32 KSI. Our tensile strength was 58 KSI. And now we're going to calculate. And what you see is it came out with an F max of 11,300 pounds. And if we go back to what our hand calculation suggested, so let's come back to the presentation. Our hand calculations just a factor of safety on 1,200 pounds of 989. If you do the math, the 11,300 um, that the well calculator says is the maximum load gives you a safety factor of 9.4. So they're very, very close, well within the range of acceptability for um, uh, considering all the other uncertainty and all the other variables. Again, I'm talking through it. it took me probably 10 seconds. Would take you guys less time. Uh, because you don't have to talk to somebody while you're filling out the forms. So more complex welds can still get sized through your weld calculator. And then I'm not going to, now that we've, we've seen the weld calculator, I'm going to take this one more step higher. This is an example proposed by uh, a gentleman named Mike Weaver. His paper is downloadable on the Internet. Um, I've, I've used it for many, many, many years. Great guy. Um, and, uh, again, there's Blodgett's name. So we're using... Uh, uh, section properties that he proposed. It's important for these calculations. And I'm not going to get into detail on these calculations. Okay? I'm, I'm going to show you a way you can do it with FEA. But certainly uh, encourage you to research and read up on this technique. So through a bunch of calculations on this particular problem with these loads, we compute a minimum throat size of about 0.18. So your throat size of 0.18 using this particular geometry. If I use the weld calculator, I end up with 0.18. So off by, excuse me, three thousandths of an inch. Pretty fast. Pretty easy to get that information. However, where does this fall apart? It falls apart when we add a third load. The load in the X direction in this particular problem, all of a sudden, I don't have a combination of buttons. Because you can choose multiple loadings in the well calculator, but I don't have a combination of buttons anymore that will give me the load in these three directions. So you're you're kind of put in a bind if the weld calculator was your only solution, and that's why we're going to get into the FEA part of it now. So if I use this, these three loads and I go back to the reference problem, the reference problem says two-tenths of an inch is my minimum throat size. So let's jump back into INCAD and then venture in INCAD. Back up, cancel out of there. So I'm going to cancel out of the weld calculator, and now we're going to pull up INCAD. And I'm going to walk through basically the techniques, and these are very well documented in the presentation if you download it. We're going to just kind of prove I can get there using FEA, not using stresses. So what we're going to do is a, a simple test model. It's about two inches. It's a two inches tall, and it's five inches 
uh, wide in the X direction, right? I've got three loads, a thousand pound load pulling in tension, thousand pound load pulling across and bending, and a thousand pound load in shear. I'm going to solve each of those independently, and we're going to look at the loads. We're going to look at the results on the mesh and see if that gives us outputs that we can compute weld size from. So one of the first things you want to do, because we're looking at bending, shear, and, and tension, those are directional forces. Uh, I can't assume that the element orientation, and this is important to know, every element in your model has an orientation based on some internal coordinate system. You can't always assume that the element results, if you look at Fx on an element or Sx, or stress in the x direction on an element, is always mapped to the global coordinate system. Um, for example, a beam, if you have a beam element, a beam x is always down the length of the beam. So what we're going to do is force, and I'm going over to the Fe model uh, entry in the tree, right click it, and I can add material orientation. This is important to do before you kick off the rut. I'm going to add it, and I'm going to add it to this surface. And I'm going to use the surface to, uh, direction, surface U. Now, maybe surface V, I want to define what I'm going to consider the X direction um, of, this, of the element. So this tells me the X direction is pointing in this direction. One thing that's good about this is if you have curved surfaces, the surface UV, which is kind of a CAD modeling term, um, will follow the contour of most surfaces. So, so it actually will be great for even more complex surfaces to be able to get... Uh, um, to be able to get a, uh, um, uh, the right forces in the right orientations pulled off your model. So we set our orientation. Um, and then what I would make sure is, is that I have uh, forces turned on on my analysis. So I'm going to run a linear static analysis. If I right click and I edit my analysis, I want to make sure force is checked. By default, it's not. I want element forces computed in my solution. And then what I can do before, um, or I can do it after, is create a group of weld elements. What I did is I created a group showing all the elements on the bottom. That way I can plot how much force is going through my weld, which is the forces going through those elements. So when I highlight those, I've created those in advance. I've created all my loads, so there's three load cases. You can combine these in real world law problems. They would all be combined, but I, you know, from an engineering perspective, I'd like to make sure that each component does what I think before I look at it combined. So we can certainly just run the problem as is. Should take more than a second. So, so now we have the results. We have results for each of these subcases, a normal, a shear, and a bending. And I'm just going to look at one of these uh, as a way to understand uh, what results I want you to look at. I'm going to create a new result window, and you can call that FY, call it whatever you want. Um, the result is going to be, in this case, a membrane FY. We said the X direction was from left to right. So I want to know my, 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 normal, my, my, yeah, my normal load. So my shell membrane force in the y direction will be my normal load. A couple of things I want to show you on post-processing this. Um, one thing you don't want to do is have averaging on, because averaging. So I'm going to turn this to elemental output and turn off averaging. What averaging does is is all the elements attached to uh, this element will be averaged across. So these two elements that touch each other will be averaged across each other. Uh, we want to look at just the load coming through this weld, not taking into account any of the support or stresses from the base part. So I'm going to go elemental, turn off averaging, and now we'll display it. And we turn off deformation. It doesn't add anything to the, the picture here. And now what we have is a, a plot of the normal force going through those elements. All right? And that tells us where the maximum is. Another way to look at that is with an XY plot. I'm going to create an XY plot that's an element load using the group I created down there. Uh, plot the x-axis along the x-direction, which is correct in this case. And the result data I want to look at is the shell membrane FY. We show that plot. We see that it's higher to the ends and settles down in the middle. And what I want to see is what is the the average because I had a thousand pounds. This is in a load per inch. I had a thousand pounds pulling 
across five inches, I should see a 200 pound per inch average of my weld load. So if I copy this data to the clipboard and I pull across an extremely complicated spreadsheet, can I get, why can't I get my spreadsheet? I don't know why I can't get this movement here. Hold on a second. For some reason, I can't drag my spreadsheet across to show it to you. So you're going to have to trust me. <laughs> there it goes. Okay. Um, I copy the clipboard, and we just be able to paste it here. I've already set up the average. The average is 200 pounds per inch. So it gives you exactly what you'd expect, but because it is elastic geometry, you're not going to get a rigid body response. You're going to get something that, that reflects the, the, the weaker edges and the more stiff insides of the part. So, so that's the technique for pulling those loads out. If I come back to my presentation, we see that if I pull those out for all three, I've got... Um, the shell membrane FY, shell membrane FXY, which is my shear, and then shell moment MY. Now, nomenclature is a little off on that. It should be MX. There's a long story as to why we chose to do that. It wasn't an accident. It was a choice based on what some other people in the industry do. But I can pull off my normal, my shear, my bending loads directly from uh, the forces in my FE model. And because they're forces, they're mesh independent. So now let's go back to our real model where we had the three different loads all combined at the same time. I'm looking at my FY. Where's my max? My max is about 5,500 pounds. What's my max shear? Well, shear, everything is covered in the shear, so I might take the average shear um, or the max, but it's a, if you want to be conservative, choose the max. And then what's my bending moment? My bending moment about this axis is my, my MY on the, the element group at the bottom. And that's 146. If I plug those into this equation, and this equation has been suggested by, uh, by Weaver, but it's based on uh, the same sorts of theories that, that it was basic statics to be able to pull out what the stress and, and the thickness of the weld should be. Plug those number in, I get a, uh, a weld thickness of 0.2, where the reference solution was 0.22. So uh, we, get a, uh, we get a really fast way, and it, it took me a long time because I'm explaining it, I've, I've done dozens of these um, in preparation for Autodesk University. If you were there, I presented this and, and then this presentation. And over the years, once you've got this, this, this equation, you're ready to go, just pull those numbers off. You only need it over a few areas of your, a few parts of your, um, uh, of your model. You plug it in and you get a recommendation on what weld uh, size should be plugged into there. That's essentially what we're talking about today. Um, but I want to talk a little bit, maybe that's a good time to pause for questions because we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about solids. Um, but what we built up the case is say the stresses in your welds, if you, especially if you model your weld to look idealized like this, are not going to be correct. The loads or the forces in your welds are going to be correct because they're mesh insensitive. And you can use those forces to compute um, the, the appropriate weld size to carry that load. We showed you a couple different ways to do that. One way is to just use the weld calculator and inventor. If you've got a simple load case, that way it's the fastest way you can get the answer. Or if you've got a more complex geometry or loading scenario, it's simply pull out those forces, plop them into the equation, and you'll be able to get an answer. So um, any questions, Dean, any, any questions relevant to this? Because we're shifting gears a little bit. No, nothing's coming in right now. Uh, it seems okay. to be pretty quiet. I think you've... Uh got everybody on the right train of thought here so okay well great good I, I hope so um, so now let's look at solids if I take that exact same problem with the same weld size I get something that where and I say this is my allowable stress of 13,200 you know would I necessarily come to the same conclusion what you see is the hot spots are highly dominated by the singularities all these edges are singularities how do I know what's real and how do I know what's singular so I've been in many, many, many a situation where, where um, an engineer or a manager would look at these results and say, we can't use that well because the stresses exceed our, our, our um, uh, allowables. But in reality, the allowable stress 
is for the most part exceeded because of this, the singularities built into the model. These are stress singularities on that constraint, stress singularities at the weld. So what can you do as far as solids go? So it was proposed, and, 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 it, and it's valid, but it's not easy, that why can't I compute my average throat stress using a solid mesh um, versus instead of looking at thinking that the stress is local to the area, in this case I've got a hot spot at these singularities, seeing those stresses are real, can I repeat the computation for average throat stress using a solid mesh? And, uh, and you can, um, but it's not straightforward and you certainly wouldn't want to mesh, if you look at the, the, the refinement of this mesh, to know if you do convergence, two, two times is never enough uh, to know if you've flattened your mesh out. So running three studies on this mesh, and this is a planar solution. I'll consider projecting this into solids on a complex weldment. Look at how fine a mesh we needed on a third, second or third pass to know we were converged. Uh, would you put this level of mesh into a complete solid model? You can, but I would, I would suggest that that is the hardest way possible to do this sort of problem. However, you know, if you go through the trouble and you see that the throat, the weld in the throat does converge, right? We get an average, and I use groups in NCAT to pull this average out. We get an average through the throat of about 2,000 PSI, the average stress of the throat. So is that reliable? Well, I throw that same problem into the weld calculator, and I get an average throat stress of 2,000 PSI. I do the hand calculation, or do the calculations using, um, using the uh, component forces out of the FE mesh, and I get a resultant stress of 2,000 PSI. So is this technique valid? Absolutely. Will you put this type, this size mesh, this degree of, of mesh density in all the welds in your model or even in, in portions of a solid model? It's pretty tedious. Yes, you can do it, but I, I, if you're not very careful, you're going to undermesh it and, and, and not understand what the results mean. And, and it's really hard not to look at these singular stresses and think that they mean something. So if you have no other choice because you've got solid, chunky geometry, keep in mind what needs to be done to look at that stress. But don't expect that stress to be real. Use the throat average throat stress based on allowables that are tried and true in practice versus thinking the actual stress calculated in that weld is okay. Because, because of all the things we talked about, that stress will never match reality. So you've got to have the mindset that I'm trying to compute essentially in a 3D complex part, what those calculations would have told me um, so that I'm, my head is in the right place versus trying to approximate a really complex, ugly situation and trusting the results. So I want one more step on that. That was always, that was full penetration. Does it fall apart when we go partial penetration? You notice I modeled the slot. We talked about that crack tip problem before. Uh, I would recommend that if you're trying to incorporate a solid mesh with partial penetration that you not, uh, that what I did is I put in a, a small radius for fatigue analysis. They actually have a, a minimum recommended radius that you assume to get reasonable responses and it actually factors into the calculations of or their, their allowable stresses and fatigue is the assumption that you have that radius. But that gives you a more reasonable stress through the throat when you're trying to compute it. If I do partial penetration, the average throat stress comes up a little bit in this particular problem. Again, I'm not saying this is the stress, this 3700 is the stress I get if I um, put a strain gauge there, but uh, it does map back to the um, calculations that, that will allow me to determine if my weld is sufficient. And also, I, I put it on the lower left. I'm using maximum principal stress uh, to ensure that I'm having tensile stresses versus mesis stress. Arguable, uh, my recommendation for best practice. Kind of summing it all up, I didn't time how long it took me on the solid mesh, and that solid mesh was, a, was really a planar mesh, so it went much faster than a solid ever would. Um, but I estimated it probably took me uh, about 15 times longer than the well calculator. Um, modeling with the plate mesh, maybe about five times longer than it would have taken with the well calculator. And if you look at those ratios, and the confidence level in the results, uh, the case is pretty strong for using the simpler methods. They're going to give you equally reliable results 
when you consider all the uncertainty that goes into weld geometry and welds with a fraction of the time. Does it ever make sense to add weld elements to the model? Um, I think I alluded to this earlier, that if your weld bead adds stiffness that affects your global results or additional mass that might affect dynamic results, then you may want to account for that. Uh, one technique for adding uh, welds without adding any solution baggage is to use what I call beam stiffeners. I can show you that real quick um, if I get out of here because uh, I had explained that to somebody at AU. The beam stiffener might be is I've created a uh, weld beam property which essentially is a beam element, a line element, and I sort of bar, but it could be a beam. And I pick a cross section that gives me the same cross sectional area, about the same uh, stiffness as the actual weld nugget itself, the weld bead itself. So with that, I can come in and associate that property to that line. Now I have the stiffness at least out of plane bending, the stiffness and the uh, the mass the weld bead might apply to that area. I can get that sort of those sort of effects, uh, but they're not changing my stresses. So uh, locally, it may affect global stress because of stiffness, but not the local stress. So again, don't don't fool yourself into thinking I just made my local weld more accurate. I've only made the weld meant uh, more accurate because I've added that stiffness in. Let's go back to the last slide. Um, yeah, pretty much that's the that's what we wanted to talk about today. I, I highly encourage you to stick with tried and true. These techniques for video welds have been around a long time. While FEA um, is, is somewhat newer than those techniques, uh, because welds don't lend themselves well to capture inside of a finite element tool, uh, the results on a finite element model of welds are very, very suspicious. In fact, rarely can you trust them. Always build in safety factors. You should be researching what safety factors are appropriate for your particular application. The simpler you keep it uh, and, and the, the more confidence you can have in your interpretation of the results. I have a saying that I use periodically. It's don't approximate complexity. Don't think, hey, if I add a more complex looking weld bead, it's going to get more accurate because it will convince you it does when it really won't. Um, and then it comes down to common sense, which is the, the best tool you have for debugging and making sure your FE models are valid is, is better common sense. So that's just about right on time. So that's, uh, that's what I wanted to talk to you guys about today. Uh, are there any questions uh, we can go over? I'm not seeing anything come in, but if anybody has questions, feel free to throw them in the panel there and we will answer them and if we can't get to them uh, you can always contact support after this so we'll be glad to answer any questions that you have uh, we typically uh, get questions about weldments from time to time so uh, we're glad to address those yeah so I see Glenn asked he couldn't find this procedure to extract forces it wouldn't necessarily be in there it's just considered a generic post-processing output uh, so the way I use it for weld uh, calculations is is well, I wouldn't say it's it's unique or outside the tool. It's just one more output. And Glenn, I'm not sure what you mean by elemental forces in the well. Oh, because for your previous previous question. Well, I'd like to believe I was that crystal clear. <laughs> Can I? Can I confirm? Yes. So inventor stress does not allow you to extract those forces. The weld calculator is an inventor. Uh, it's an inventor functionality. You do not need NCAD for the weld calculator, but you cannot pull those weld forces out. Um, and you don't have the element orientation capabilities um, and, and certainly don't have the graphing capabilities inside of the inventor stress analysis. You would need to either go to NCAD or simulation mechanical to get that. What else? So one of the things that, that Dean and I talked about is, you know, I, since we don't have the poll, is anybody interested in taking this to the next step to talk a little bit about weld fatigue, maybe in a later presentation? 
Glenn, well, Glenn is getting a gold star for the day. He's uh, paying attention. <laughs> And Glenn, maybe maybe you and I ought to just spend some one-on-one -on -one time. It sounds like you're very interested in this, and I'd be happy to spend some time with you on that. If I, uh, uh, Dean, do you know how to get a hold of Glenn? Uh, I believe we have his contact information, so we can follow up with him after. And and uh, I think we have some open slots in the future at the beginning of next year. So we may just throw in a, a fatigue uh, weld topic there if. Um, Glenn's interested. I'm, I'm sure other people are interested. It looks like they're being very quiet, so um, it's it's up to Vince if he has time uh, when we can fit that into a into our schedule. So okay, just uh, keep checking back. Check the schedule on the uh, forums. That's where we kind of keep up to date on what's coming out. Uh, we're we're in the process of selecting new topics, so. Uh, keep checking back there for what's coming up, and uh, be sure we'll be sending out an update after this uh, presentation with the YouTube link. And looks like we have another question. I have an Autodesk Inventor Student Edition. Is it possible to have the looks like uh, web calculator or weld uh, calculator? Yeah, I'm sure it's the weld calculator. So, uh, Lewis, what I would suggest is try it. Um, create a simple assembly, convert it to a weldment. If you're not sure how to do that, see it's, um, it's back over here. In um, let's get out of InCAD. If I want to go to, um, I think it's assemble. Maybe you know faster than I do, Dean. I always have to look for it. Environments. Um, convert to weldment under environments. There's a button convert to weldment. I've already converted to the weldment, so. I can't do it again. But if you've got an assembly and you go to environments, convert to weldment, if you can do that, then once you're in, then you get a weld drop down and you should see the weld calculator right in the middle. Um, that's my recommendation is you just try it because I don't know what they do or don't add in the student edition. It does have a weld connector. Yes, it would. I've already made that recommendation. So the question is, we nice to have a weld connector where the force at the connections can be plotted without the extra processing steps. And and, and there's there's no reason other than re the priorities and resources not to, not to do it. Uh, the recommendation is in. Don't know where it stands in the roadmap, though. Okay. We all set? I think we're all set. So I want to thank everybody for attending and thank Vince for helping out with this. Uh, we always appreciate him uh, stepping in and giving some presentations on uh, things that he's very knowledgeable about. So um, next up uh, on the 19th of January, we have a troubleshooting nonlinear models webinar. So I invite everybody to... Uh, attend that, and I look forward to speaking with you guys in the future if you have support cases. And that's my email address. If you chat it down uh, and you have questions you want to send me directly, don't hesitate. Thanks, everybody, for attending. Have a great rest of your week.